Thank you so much, Alan. You do a great job, and uh, you're a great addition to, uh, to what we do here. Thank you. Hey, uh, how is everybody doing? It's great to see you today. I just want you to know we had to go get more communion today. That's such a nice thing, all right? It's great to have you here. I want to encourage you, if you're a guest with us today, we have what we call a Connect card that's right in front of you. If you would fill out your information and give that to us, we certainly would appreciate it. As I say, we aren't going to bug you, but we do want to uh, just give you a little email letting you know that we're so glad that you came to worship with us today. I want to call out a few announcements uh, today. Uh, next week, uh, not, uh, yeah, next week is daylight savings time. Uh, don't want to forget that. You want to make sure that you set your clocks back on Saturday night at about an hour. Don't forget. And I'm sorry. Forward. Thank you, Matt. Forward. Forward forward set your clocks forward an hour so uh, if you mess this up and you come here you get a prize if I just want to let you know we're, 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 we'll, we'll yeah we'll, we'll give you a, a great announcement that day uh, we're going to roll out as we talked about a new platform here that's uh, very exciting it's called sub splash giving and you can get that on your app and i want to give you some reasons why that we're doing this because realm is going to go away and we're going to start with sub splash uh, basically, this is going to be more secure than writing checks. We're trying to kind of do away with some checks, but if you still want to write a check, we'll take it, believe me. Uh, but this is more secure. And then also, this is going to save the church thousands of dollars each year getting rid of Realm and going to Subsplash. It's fast and it's easy. And uh, basically, there is a giving tab on the new app that you have loaded, downloaded on your phone. There will be a giving app that you can go to. And today, we have Jessica Pyatt is Doug's daughter-in-law. And she's going to be right out here. There's a table dedicated to that to show you, to lead you through the steps of how to do that, to get rid of the realm giving and go to Subsplash. So if you have questions, you can go right directly after service to the table, or you can go to the website, our website, and that'll explain you how to do that, how to switch over. So I wanted to remind you of that. Uh, Impact, which is our student ministry, Christopher Lawrence, I know he's so thrilled to be back to having students. He had his first meeting this past Wednesday. This coming Wednesday, 6.30 to 8, will be the time for student impact. So if you have a child that's in that uh, junior high age group, high school age group, a grandchild, let them know they can come here on Wednesday night, 6.30 to 8.00. And then Celebrate Recovery is going to move to a new time, the new, new day and new time. Actually, it's going to start this week on Wednesday. Celebrate Recovery helps people going through addictions, they're getting, getting rid of that, and just living the new life. And so it's 7 to 8.30 on Wednesdays, and it starts this week. And then uh, Friday, the March 19th at 7.30 over in the Worship Center. Next door, Jesse's going to, and her team's going to lead us in a night of worship. It's going to be a wonderful night. I want to encourage you to be a part of that. And this is a time where we, uh, even though we have two different services, our church families can come together on a night like this. And then the last thing I have to mention to you is uh, Jimmy Pig, one of our security guys, asked me to make this announcement. We used to have 26 security people, and it can be men and women, 26 people on the security team, and now we're down to about 12. So they're having to duplicate themselves every, every week. And so whether you're a man or a woman, and, and ladies, listen, I know that you like to order us men around, so you would be perfect for this position, all right? Security, so be thinking about that. Whether you're a man or a woman, you can help us in this effort. If you have a, a basically a desire to do this, uh, there's a need here, a big need. So won't you uh, talk to one of the security guys today and let them know, hey, I would like to find out more about this. Again, and thank you so much for being here. Looking forward to our, our time together today. And one more thing. <laughs> Elijah, come on up here, buddy. Elijah uh, has been in. He is our missionary to Kenya with New International Ministries. And so we were able to take a team over to Kenya in 2018. Uh, Tula, Cameron, um, Michelle. Uh, Schmoker and Monica Schmoker and uh, myself and we had a great time and so uh, Elijah's in his wife Ellen and his mother-in-law Marilyn are here and I just wanted Elijah to come he said he's going to be here we're going to meet with him after church but I just wanted you to hear from him so he can give you just a quick update on what's going over on over in Kenya so why don't you give Elijah a hand for being here today. Good morning. 
I'm so pleased to come to this church. I'm encouraged to see how you are doing, how you have taken up steps to care for the coronavirus. You are taking your measures, and I appreciate that God is going to keep you and continue to take that corona away from you. And I thank this church for all that they have done in Africa. I knew this church. I came to this church, and you welcomed me. Until now, you have helped us to do many things in Africa. You have helped us to train more pastors, like our brother Daryl has been coming over and has trained a lot of pastors there. And most pastors didn't have even a, a training in a Bible college. But this church, because Daryl is your member, they have done a lot in Africa. Uh, Fred Wagona has also done a lot. He has trained lead like Jesus, only coronavirus has been a problem. We didn't do it in the last year in December. But we had seminars last year, only one. And that's the leadership seminar. We had 104 in February, and that's when coronavirus hit us. So from there, we have been doing what we call relief projects, and we have been helping people because like uh, jobs were closed, schools were closed, and people were already struggling. So our work has been helping them and trying to bring them back to normal. And the schools were also closed. We helped the, the kids. We gave them food and relief. And I hope maybe I will share pictures with, the, with the Craig to pass to you. But we have been uh, struck by that, as you have. But the problem in Africa, we don't have the stimulus. Like, uh, you can talk about stimulus checks. They are coming soon. We don't have things like that. We, we depend on help from di different areas, like outside the world. And most churches like you will come in and you will help us. So thank you for this church, for being a good church, for following what your leaders are doing. You are very good pastors, for volunteering to do whatever you are able to do, for teaching and for in encouraged being in a classroom, encouraged being sharing with others, sharing with the people I met sometimes here who are poor and who need Christ. And that's the work of Christ. He called us so that we can worship together. He called us, we can fellowship together, and we can sharpen each other. So as we go back to Kenya, I'm just the only one going. My wife is going to be staying because our kids have grown. And uh, I'll be going to Africa uh, March 22nd until May 9th. And my duty there, I'll be encouraging people there and also doing some water projects and uh, trying to do school projects for water because the coronavirus government wants us to do more regulations on how kids line up to fetch water, line up to wash hands, and those measures are really tough. So I'm going to help on those. So thank you very much. I know there are many things that God wants us to, say, to share with you, but I will encourage you to continue clinging to each other and loving one another and encouraging the church, because if you're in the church, you really have encouragement. But if you sleep at home, you'll be just tired. <laughs> it's true, you'll be tired. And God bless you, and God bless Broadway Christian Church. Thank you, Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's say a word of prayer for Legion as ministry. God, we just thank you so much uh, The Legion, Ellen, and Marilyn could be here today, and the girls. Just thank you for protecting them in the past year through uh, the coronavirus, Lord, allowing them to be in the States and uh, just uh, spend more time with family and uh, be over at Southeast. Uh, God, we just uh, thank you for what you're doing and what you've done through him and Ellen and their ministry. Nasha Ministries and the lives that have been changed. And so I pray for our church family to get, uh, uh, to get a little interest here and just uh, go online and check out Nasha Ministries and, and uh, go with the new international site and just continue to lift up Elijah and Ellen. Uh, Elijah will be going back here for a couple months, and so I pray your protection for him. And God, again, just as they minister in the town of Narak, I just pray that lives will continue to be changed through what they do. And God, grow, grow the church, the big church there, Lord, as well. Strengthen them in the midst of hardships, in the midst of difficulties. Help them to hang on to the hope they have in you. Ask your blessing and your favor to continue to be upon him. And the kingdom will grow through what he does and what they do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, buddy. Welcome to all of you. It is so good to see so many faces back for the first time. If you're here for your first time, would you raise your hand just real quick? Yeah, look around you. 
all these wonderful folks that are here for the first time. And those of you at home, we want to say good morning and welcome to you as, as well. And uh, as we continue to grow, there's plenty of room here for you and is so glad that you uh, have joined us online today. Uh, this morning, as we begin, we've got a wonderful service for you, but I want us to, to think about one thing in particular. But uh, for all of us, our names are important, aren't they? That's how we are recognized. So on three, would you just speak your name? One, two, three. Mark. Any idea what names were out there? It was kind of a mess, wasn't it? But there is one name that is a unifying name of all the people in the world. His name is Jesus. Would you say that? Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Alan, let's begin. Would you stand? Let's sing together. scripture, names were given a specific reason, for a specific reason. They had purpose. Ananias, who took in Saul of Tarsus and anointed his eyes with salve, was chosen because his name means grace. The first thing Saul saw when his eyes regained sight, the, that which he heard, that which he touched in his blindness, was God's grace. Zechariah and Elizabeth, their names mean God has remembered and the oath of God. Together, as husband and wife, their names mean God has remembered the oath of God. They gave birth to Yachanan, John the Baptist, whose name means grace of God. And it is the same with the name Jesus. In Hebrew, his name is Yeshua, which means salvation.
We know Jesus by many names. Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, the bright morning star, beloved and bridegroom. In the Song of Songs, chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, we read, May he kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Your name is like purified oil. What a, a strange thing to say about a name. Until you understand what Solomon meant in this verse. This song is obviously about a bride and a groom, but ultimately it's about Jesus and you and me. These verses are the bride speaking to and about the groom. Your oils have a pleasing fragrance. Your name is like purified oil. Oils carried the scent of spices. When they were poured out of their container, a sweet, fragrant smell would fill the air. has another name which we haven't yet mentioned. Jesus was also known as the Christ. Christ comes from the Greek word Christos. Christos was a translation of the Hebrew word Mashiach. Mashiach is Hebrew for Messiah. Messiah means the anointed one. One who is anointed with oil.
all God's people said? Amen. Amen. For those of you at home, we want to invite you to get your communion supplies ready as Matt Marsh, one of our elders, comes and leads us in our communion meditation this morning. Good morning. The sunshine and warmer weather this week has caused my mind to drift to thoughts of summer on more than one occasion. The older I get, the more I dread the cold, so each March I, I very uh, well welcome the warm weather that teases us. One of my favorite aspects of summer includes the cookouts that go with it, a time to come together, eat favorite foods, tell stories, and laugh. Those thoughts are even stronger this year because of what the pandemic took away from us last summer. As I was thinking those thoughts while also preparing this meditation, I couldn't help but see the parallels. While communion time is many things for all of us, a time to remember, a time for self-examination, and a time for thanksgiving, I'm going to ask us to consider a joyous approach this morning. Jesus chose a meal, the Passover meal, which, uh, for his last supper, which is a time of celebration for the Jewish people. This morning, I'm going to ask us to approach our quiet time with the same sense of celebration. It's already been mentioned we had to get more uh, materials, supplies for our communion today, and that's a great thought and a great feeling within itself. In 1 Timothy uh, 1, 15 and 16, Paul writes, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of who I am the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his immense patience as an example for those who would believe in him and receive eternal life. If that's not a, a need and a reason for a joyous celebratory spirit during this time of togetherness and remembrance, I'm not sure what is. Will you bow and pray with me? Heavenly Father, we, we're just so thankful this morning. Uh, thankful uh, that you're our provider, uh, that you're giving us the warm weather, the sunshine, uh, the ability to come here and worship you. We're thankful that you're our redeemer, uh, that you have a plan for us, that you have so much love, uh, so much grace, and so much mercy, that you would send Jesus to walk on this earth, to be not only an example, uh, to not only be proof of your love, but to be a sacrifice for us, for our sins, so that we may have eternal life with you. This morning, Father, I ask that we think of that life that Jesus lived, the sacrifices uh, and this, the ultimate sacrifice that he made, and just ask that, that a spirit of joy, a spirit of celebration, and a spirit of thanksgiving be with us during this time. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.
Well, good morning, Broadway. It's certainly good to see you this morning. Glad you're joining us online as well. As we come to week five in our Burning Questions series, I want to, I want you to remember something and hang on to something that I mentioned last week in uh, in my message because we need to realize that for this week as well. Uh, when it comes to questions, you need to remember this: questions define the relationship. I think you were able to see that from last week. Questions, you see, allow a person to see where the other person stands in the relationship. Questions allow insight. Questions tend to make us think deeper about the relationship. So keep that in mind as we look at this specific question from Jesus today. And then secondly, this specific question that we're going to study today is another question that has your name attached to it. It's a question, even though it was spoken some 2,000 years ago to an invalid lying beside a pool of water, it's a question which Jesus lobs your way today. Do you want to get well? Whether you've been in church all your life or this is your first time ever in a church or watching a church service online, I want you to understand this question, do you want to get well, it's a question that has your name attached to it. And my prayer today is that you would see this truth, and not only that you would see this truth, but that you would deal with this truth by answering the question, honestly, today, do you want to get well? I want to look at uh, John chapter 5. I want to just stay focused in the first nine verses of John chapter 5. So if you would, turn, uh, turn to that passage in John, and let's start reading together. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. Now there is in Jerusalem near the Sheep Gate a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Here a great number of disabled people used to lie, the blind, the lame, and the paralyzed. One who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. And when Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in that condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? Sir, the invalid replied, I have no one to help me into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes down ahead of me. And then Jesus said to him, get up, exclamation point, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and walked. I want to divide this message up into three parts today. I want to look at the setting, the situation, and the solution. Let's talk about the setting first. We see in verse 1, Jesus had returned to Jerusalem after spending some time in Galilee. You can go back and look at the first four chapters of John and see that for yourself. Now, we don't know really how long Jesus had spent, how much time he had spent in Galilee. All we know is that it says some time later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And we also see from John's text that he tells us why Jesus decided to go back to Jerusalem. Sometime later, Jesus went up to Jerusalem for one of the Jewish festivals. 
Scholars differ on exactly what festival this was, so I'm not going to spend time uh, today on that specific topic. I'll let you dig into that later if you, if you so choose. But most scholars would agree that it was one of the big three festivals, one of the big three feasts. It was either Pentecost, it was Passover, or it was Tabernacle. But understand, understand today, this festival was not the only reason, the sole reason, Jesus returned to Jerusalem. As Jesus was on all his life, he was on a mission. He had an appointment to meet with somebody in Jerusalem and and many in Jerusalem. In the same way that Jesus had an appointment to meet with the woman at the well in Samaria, which is in chapter 4, Jesus had an appointment to meet with somebody in Jerusalem. And we see that throughout Jesus' life. As we look at his life, we see that Jesus is constantly being led by his Father, by the Spirit, to meet with people, to have appointments with people. Jesus even said, I'm not about myself. I'm not about my own agenda. I only do what the Father tells me to do and what he has me speak. And so just like the woman in the well at Samaria, Jesus would meet somebody who had lost their hope, somebody who needed a boost in life, somebody who needed a change in their life. And John tells us in our text that Jesus, once he went into Jerusalem, he finds his way to a certain pool. Uh, And now that pool, it just wasn't any old pool. That pool was very special. It was a very special pool. And John describes that pool for us. Now there in Jerusalem, near the Sheep Gate, a pool, which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, and which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. Let's talk about this pool a little bit. This pool was called Bethesda. In the Hebrew, it meant house of mercy. And you're going to see how this pool plays into this story later on. And this pool was located on the northern side of the Temple Mount, near what was known as the Sheep Gate. Now, it was called the Sheep Gate because more than likely the sheep came through there on their way to the temple. They came through this gate, thus named the Sheep Gate. Now, to give you a decent picture of the size of this pool, uh, I want to quote from Max Lucado. He researched this, and uh, in this book, You're Never Alone, he says this pool was 393 feet long, 164 feet wide, and 49 feet deep. So that's a pretty big pull, isn't it? And to show you, show you more of its size, notice that John is sure to mention, uh, attached to this verse, that there were five covered colonnades around this pool. Colonnade is a porch. There were five covered porches around. And you can just picture how the steps probably were descending down to this pool and the porches surrounding this pool. And the, the, they were covered to keep the invalid, to keep the people who were sick out of the sun. And so just a side note here, I think this is such a cool thing about this pool of Bethesda. Now, it was destroyed sometime after Jerusalem was overtaken in A.D. 70, sometime after that. Now, that's not the cool part, all right? The cool part is that archaeologists, they they, they discovered that there was a pool similar to the dimensions of this pool underneath a Byzantine church. Its dimensions were very, very similar to the dimensions that I just mentioned earlier. And so I hope that you find that that that's pretty cool. It's always neat, I think, and cool when uh, when archaeologists find stuff that backs up the Bible. Now, we don't need that because we take the Bible by faith, but it just increases my faith all the more when I see that happen. So in verses 3 and 4, this was not just a large pool, but it was a significant pool. John tells us the significance of this particular pool. Look what John tells us about this pool of Bethesda. Here at this pool, a great number of disabled people used to lie. The blind, the lame, the paralyzed. Now just picture that scene. 393 feet long, 164 feet wide. And you have all these sick people lying around at that pool. And something I want you to notice is in your Bibles, if you have something other than a King James Bible... You probably don't have verse 4 listed there, do you? I think that's interesting. Uh, It's more than likely verse 4 is located at the bottom uh, in the footnote section of that page of your Bible. The reason for this is that scholars believe that, 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 or scholars know that this was not in the original manuscript. It originally was in there when the King James was written, and then they found older manuscripts, right? And then they looked and it wasn't in there. And so they they excluded it, but they still included it in the footnote of your section. But that footnote section, verse 4, does give a little more insight into what people believed the power had, the power of that pool had. Look at it. From time to time, this is verse 4, an angel of the Lord would come down and stir up the waters. 
The first one into the pool after each disturbance would be cured of whatever disease they had. Now, this stirring of the waters, I think it's easily explained in that so many pools back at this time in Jerusalem were fed by intermittent springs. Periodically throughout Jerusalem, waters were released from hidden reservoirs in the hills around Jerusalem, causing these springs to rise and to fall suddenly, thus explaining why the waters were stirred. Uh, scholars say that this pool that they found uh, back in the early 19th century, that uh, it was like two different st- uh, sections of the pool. One was a deeper pool, and one was a, a sh- more shallow end, a pool where people could go into the pool. As you know, when this deeper end would fill up, it's just like if you run water eventually in your bathtub, it's going to fall out if you don't undo the drain. And so that's kind of the picture that I want to paint for you there. But I want to make a, a, a quick point about this, this pool and what happened there. Uh, the healings associated with it. I want you to know, guys, nowhere in Scripture do we see this as a way to be healed. And I know what some of you are thinking. Your mind's probably immediately going to the Old Testament when Elisha told Naaman to go dip seven times in where? In the Jordan River, right? But that was a river, not a pool. And that was Elisha, not Jesus. Jesus healed all kinds of people. Never, never did we see him one time tell somebody to go to the pool of Bethesda to be healed. He touched people to heal them. He spit and made mud to heal people. He spoke and healed people. He told the ten lepers to go on their way to the temple before the priest and healed them. But never, never do we see in the Bible that he tell them to go to the pool of Bethesda to be healed. But here's the thing. Regardless of that fact, regardless of that truth, who do we find at the pool? (laughs) A great number of people, right, that needed help. And so as I think about that, church, I think about those words tell me the state of the people who were gathered at that pool, who who went to that pool for healing. They were desperate people, and desperate people do desperate things. Evidently, the people believed that this pool had some type of healing power to it, because why in the world would they come there day after day to that pool? Common sense would tell you they wouldn't do that. So understand, church, the people gathered there around that pool We're desperate. Think about the desperation which took place here day after day. Put yourself into their situation. Day after day, these people would come and they would do what? They would wait. They would wait for that angel. They would come and sit or come and lie down next to the pool in hopes that they would be the next one to be healed, hoping that they could be the next one made whole. And can you imagine what their lives must have been like? And there was no one more desperate than this man that Jesus went up to. So that's the setting. Let's look at the situation, the particular situation of the invalid lying beside the pool. Look how John describes him. John says, one who was there had been an invalid for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned that he had been in this condition for a long time, he asked him, do you want to get well? And notice John tells us this man had been an invalid for 38 years. Let that sink in today. He'd been dealing with his problem for 38 years. No change in his life for 38 years. For 38 years, this man had been coming to the pool, hoping to get his turn to be the first one in after the waters were stirred. But notice the Bible doesn't say that this man stayed there for 38 years. It doesn't say that he came there day after day for 38 years. It just says that he had been an invalid for 38 years. We really don't know how often he came to this pool, but we do know when he came, somebody had to bring him. Someone had to carry him there, and someone had to lie him down at that pool because he was an invalid. More than likely, this man, man suffered from some type of paralytic illness that made him unable to walk. He was dependent on somebody else. And so I I want you to think with me here. I want to give you the picture of what happened day after day. Day after day, somebody would carry this man by this pool. They would lay, lay down his mat, and this man would lay down day after day. Who knows how often he came. But he would be here at this pool. He may be doing that. He may be doing this. I don't know how he sat. But day after day, 38 years. Go back, 1983. 1983, this man had been coming to this pool. 
I, I wasn't married. I just, I just was married then. Don't tell my wife I just said that. I was just married then. 1983. I weighed 160 pounds in 1983. I wasn't even in the ministry in 1983. Think about where you were 38 years ago, church. And this is what you did for 38 years. Let that sink in. Hoping that you would be the next one to get into the pool to be healed. Thirty-eight years. He waited. Do you like to wait? I don't like to wait. This man waited for 38 years. Do you see why Jesus might have picked this guy out of all the other ones? Was there anyone else there more desperate for a life change than this guy? 38 years. This man came. This man was hoping that he would be the next to be healed. Look what John tells us, what Jesus did. Jesus, when he came there, he saw the man. When Jesus saw him lying there and learned, Jesus could have known this man with his divine spirit, or he could have been asking questions. Maybe this wasn't the first time Jesus came around this pool, but that he had been in this condition for a long time. He asked him, do you want to get well? And I don't know about you, church, but I find comfort in those words from John. Those words stood out to me when Jesus saw him lying there. I hope that you find comfort and strength in those words today. Jesus hadn't met this man before, more than likely. He saw him lying there, though. And just take a moment and remind yourself today, church, that Jesus sees you. Would you repeat that with me? Say this out loud with me. Jesus sees me. Jesus sees me. Don't ever forget that Jesus sees you. And I think of Jesus' wonderful words in Matthew's gospel. says this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. You know, knowing Jesus sees me is a game changer for me. I don't know about you, but it's fuel for my life. No matter how bad life gets, no matter what I go through in life, no matter what my situation is, church, knowing Jesus sees me is something that I hold on to tightly. But understand the ones gathered around the pool of Bethesda, more than likely they didn't have that fuel for their lives. Their fuel came in believing a superstition. Their fuel came in a fairy book tale. Their... their, Their fuel came and sending money in for a handkerchief to be healed. Here they had the one in front of them who could give them hope, who could give them a change, who could give them a future. And yet they didn't even see him because their focus was not on a pool, it was on a pool and not on a person. You ever been there? You ever been focused on the pool instead of the person? The great preacher Charles Spurgeon wrote, A blindness had come over these people at the pool. There they were, and there was Christ. Who could heal them? But not a single one of them sought him. Their eyes were fixed on the water, expecting it to be troubled. They were taken up with their own chosen way, that the true way was neglected. Jesus asked him the question, Do you want to get well? Do you want to get well? Man, it seems like a strange question, doesn't it? Knowing what we know about this guy from the outside looking in, it seems like an offensive question. Certainly one that we wouldn't ask today, right? Do do I want to get well? What do you mean? Look at me. What do you think? You would think the man would have snapped back at Jesus with those words, wouldn't you? Of course I want to get well. But notice the man's response to Jesus. He said, sir, the man replied, I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, someone else goes on down ahead of me. And I think even stranger than that question is is the man's answer back to Jesus. The man didn't even answer Jesus' question. What did the man do? Instead of giving Jesus an answer to his question, he gave Jesus an excuse. He gave Jesus an excuse as to why he couldn't get in the pool. As to why he couldn't be healed, the man said, I have no one to help me. Really? You have no one to help it. Who brought you to the pool in the first place? What about those people? 
Time after time, as many times as you came, somebody had to bring you. They couldn't help you. They couldn't have stayed with you throughout the day. I guarantee you, if Mike and Steve and, and somebody else in here, we could, we could block the, the steps going down into that pool. We'll get you in that pool if you really care about you, right? No one to help me? Come on, man. And, and so I, I look at this guy, and I look, and I think he's just like the rest of us. Our names are attached to this. I think he has grown accustomed to his life. He had grown accustomed to things that will ne they'll never change. Maybe, maybe in years one or two, he had hope. Maybe even in years five or ten, he had hope that he would be healed, that he would be the next one in, that his life would change. But 38 years, guys, 38 years, he had grown accustomed to his situation. He had grown accustomed to life on his mat. Maybe you think I'm being harsh here, insensitive. But let me ask you this morning, let me turn it around to, to you, to me. What, what's your mat? What's your mat today? What's your situation or your issue that you've been dealing with that has caused you to just accept it? What's your is situation or issue that you've grown accustomed to in your life? Your situation or issue that you just live with? And, and maybe an even better question today, church, is what excuses do you offer up as to why things don't change in your situation with your marriage you just settle you've grown accustomed to being that way to being distant you have no one to help you no counselors out there that would be more than willing to sit down with you no preacher that would be able to no friend that would be able to come to you with your finances you keep living in debt no no changes you don't seek help you try to do it on your own with your addiction pornography drugs whatever it may be no help, no one to help you, come on. With your attitude, you're sour, you're mean. You've just grown accustomed to doing that. No. Your hopelessness today. You don't have to have hopelessness today. But you've just grown accustomed to living life without hope. You've just grown accustomed to lying on your mat. You keep doing the same old things. You keep going through the same old cycles. You keep making the same old excuses. Does any of that sound familiar? How long have you been lying on your mat? In 1968, my dad was hit by a drunk driver, flew out the window of a 65 Mustang into a creek bed, um, and he lived. 1968 to 1973, my dad dealt with issues. This story speaks to me so much about my dad. For five years, I was five years old, from five to ten years old, I saw my dad go into seizures. I saw my dad uh, pretty much be uh, groggy, uh, not himself. Uh, didn't really have a, a relationship in doing things with my dad for five years. My dad, uh, back in the day, they gave things like shock treatments. My dad went to psychiatrists. My dad went to Columbus for hospital visits, doctor visits, medication. On and on and on, my dad lived that way for five years years it was not a pleasant experience he wasn't mean wasn't mean to me didn't hit me didn't beat me but it just I didn't have my dad for five years until one day my dad did this my dad he, he was depressed he had the, he, had, he was disabled during that time because of the accident but one day my dad said I'm done with this and I, I probably two times I've seen my dad cry in his life and I can still remember at 10 years old, my dad saying, I'm done. I'm not living like this anymore. And he took his pills and he flushed them down the toilet and he never looked back. Never looked back. He was able to go back to work. But I think of this story and I think of my dad. How long did he lie on that mat? Let me ask you today, how desperate are you to get off your mat? Are you desperate enough to give up the excuses as to why your life doesn't change? Are you desperate enough to quit trying to fix your situation or your issue on your own efforts, on your own wisdom? Are you desperate enough to take help from someone who can change your situation? Because church, understand, you will never change what you're willing to tolerate. You will never change what you're willing to tolerate. Do you want to get well? 
I don't know if you noticed this or not, but one thing which really stood, another thing that stood out to me in this part of the story is Jesus, he didn't play into the man's excuse, did he? He didn't play into it at all. He didn't even give him a reply to his excuse. What did Jesus give this man? The very thing he needed. He gave him a miracle. A miracle so he could believe again. Look at Jesus' words to this man. Jesus said to him, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And at once the man was cured. At once the man was cured. He picked up his mat and he walked away. Think of that. Think of that. He picked up his mat. He rolled it up. Maybe he was so excited that he didn't even roll it up. Right? He just hopped along on his way, happy. And he went away. From the outside looking in, I find those words to be strange. Jesus said to the man, get up and walk. Hello, the man said, do you see me? Look at me. I've been 38 years in this situation. I've lived like this. Certainly strange words, again, from the outside looking in, but not for the one who spoke those words. Not for the one who held the power to solve this man's situation and your situation today. That one said to the man, get up, pick up your mat and walk. And that man walked immediately. At once, he was cured. He picked up his mat and he went home. As we wind down today, church, I hope that you find the hope in those words that we just looked at. The man in our story had lost the one thing that we all need, and that's hope. This man had given up. I see him as giving up. Yeah, he came to the pool every day, or not every day, but he came to the pool as often as he did, but come on, man. 38 years, he had grown accustomed to his situation. He had settled for life on his mat. But then, but then he met Jesus. So let me tell you this. I don't know what your situation is today. I don't know what issue has been plaguing you in your life. Maybe you're like the man in the story. You've tried. You've tried solving your situation on your own efforts. You've tried what everyone else is doing, and yet you still are on your mat. Let me give you a suggestion today. Can I give you a suggestion today? Can I speak into your situation Learn what the man in our story had to learn. Learn there's only one who can truly heal you. Learn that there's only one who can truly make you well physically and spiritually. There's only one who can truly change your situation. There's only one who can get you off your mat, and his name is Jesus. And so let me ask you this. Won't you give him a try? And let me leave you with this. Do you want to get well? Would you pray with me? Father, I uh, thank you so much for this story. Man, I, uh, it's a very personal story to me. Uh, as I just said about my dad, but even in my own life, God, things that I just get accustomed to. And I know, I know I'm not alone. God, I know that your spirit's speaking to people t- right now watching us, people that are here about their life. God, sometimes we get tired. Sometimes we forget that we have hope. Sometimes we forget that you see us. So God, I pray today that your spirit would just grow. Grow your people through this. Help us to see that we don't have to be on that mat. We can get rid of that mat. We can get up. And you can give us a new future. You can change us, God. And I pray that we would realize, God, sometimes (laughs) maybe we don't realize that we need a change. Maybe we're just comfortable with this. But God... Speak to us and show us that we need a change sometimes. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. Jesus, thank you for the power of your words. Get up, take your mat, and go home. Help us to cling to those words today that you will do the same for us. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to stand right now. If you have a decision upon your heart, if you don't know Jesus Christ, as your Savior and you want to get off that mat today, let me encourage you to come. Come today and be introduced to the one who can help you, who can change your life, who can give you a hope and a future. Maybe you just need prayer today, something about your mat that you're lying on that you can't deal with on your own. We're here to help you. You don't have to go through it alone. Come and get help. See me after the service. Call me this week. Call Mark. Call one of the elders this week. Don't deal with stuff on your own. It's what the church family is about. 
And maybe just, uh, again, if you need prayer, if you want to join this church family, we ask you to come as we, as we sing. thank you again. It's uh, so encouraging to us to uh, see us run out of communion, to have more people here. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in uh, with us uh, online today. Uh, just ask your blood, God's blessing upon your week. And let me just remind you about giving. Thank you so much for continuing to give. If you're here today and you, need a, you want to put in an offering, you haven't been here in a while, then the way we do it, we have these two, uh, bu- I say buckets, these two uh, containers up here that we put the offering in. Uh, if you're watching from home, continue. You can, we still take checks. We will still take checks. But uh, we're look, going through a new giving, and it's called Subsplash. And just let me remind you, right out the door, there's a table there. Uh, Doug's daughter-in-law, Jessica, will be there to help you uh, go through that and change over if you want to do that. Because you have a choice, right? We're just encouraging you with this choice. So have a great week. Thank you for being here.